Now, if you were here with us last Lord's Day, we looked at John chapter 14 and the fact that the Lord Jesus is preparing for his people a place in the heaven of God. And there is within those opening verses of John 14 a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ when he says that I will come again and receive you unto myself. And this morning we want to consider the, the Saviour's return for his people. A number of weeks ago when we began the series, uh, Who is Jesus? We, we stated right at the very beginning that it is our belief that we have to be right about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be right in our understanding and our belief concerning him. For the very simple reason that if we are not right, then we cannot be saved. And I know that's a very strong statement, but I believe it's a fearful thing to be wrong about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so to that end, we, we turn to the Word of God. And we have looked through the Scriptures as to what the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that because we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. And we have no doubts our reservations about what it says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the Bible declares that he is the eternal son of God, we believe it. When it says that he is the virgin born son of God, we believe it. When it says that he is the miracle working son of God, we believe that also. When it tells us that he is the sinless son of God, when he's the crucified Son of God, the resurrected Son of God, the ascended Son of God. We believe those things. When it describes the Lord Jesus as interceding for us at the Father's right hand and preparing a place in heaven for us, we believe it because the Bible has said it. We believe every word of it. Now this morning when we come to consider what the scriptures say concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that also. The Lord Jesus said very clearly in that passage last week, I will come again. That's John 14 verse 3, I will come again. And that's the subject we want to address this morning. And I want you to think about it under a number of headings. First of all, how truthful is the message of our Lord's return. How truthful it is. Alexander McLaren was an old time preacher. And he said, the primitive church thought much about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. More so than about death or about heaven itself. The early Christians were not looking for a cleft in the ground called a grave but a cleaving of the heavens for glory. They were watching not for the undertaker, but for the upper taker. They were ready and prepared for the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. They firmly believed the promise that he gave that he would come again. And they lived each day believing that the Lord Jesus could come that day. When he said he would return, they took him at his word. Now, when we think about the Savior's return, we recognize there is a certain mystery concerning the timing of his return. Because while the Savior said that he would return, he didn't give us a particular time frame for that return. He left the actual time and the date of his Second Advent shrouded in mystery. That's why we read in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, the words of the Lord Jesus, he said, but of that day, the day of his return, and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven. In Matthew 25 and verse 13, the Savior gave this instruction, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We simply don't know 
We can't pinpoint on a calendar the day or the hour in which the Saviour will return. Now the church, the body believing, has always looked for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's fair to say that within the last 100 years or so, that we have seen things happening in the world that many have interpreted to mean that the Lord's coming is upon us. The restoration of Israel as a nation in 1948 certainly aroused a lot of people's attention to the coming of the Saviour again. I remember very clearly, uh, I was at university at the time, when the Gulf Wars started and that spawned the whole proliferation of end time literature. I'm sure you can well remember the hullabaloo over Y2K. And even in recent years, there's been all kinds of chatter and talk about blood moons and the like. And people have interpreted these events to mean that the coming of the Lord is upon us. The only question that I have for those that make these predictions and set these dates, the question I have is this, what part of what the Savior said do you not understand? The day and the hour no man knows. We cannot know. The Savior spoke clearly that we cannot predict the day or the hour when he will return. It's shrouded in mystery. And so I want to warn you there is no code for breaking the Bible and unlocking the mystery of the day and the hour of the Savior's return. You cannot determine the date by using various calculations or putting numeric values into the Bible prophecies. Now that's not to say that certain events and happenings in the world aren't a foretelling of the Saviour's return. We may not know the day or the hour, but we're told that we might recognize the times and the seasons. But there's still an element of mystery involved in the Saviour's return with regards to its timing. And yet in spite of the mystery, there is still a certainty regarding his return. We may not know the time, but we are in no doubt at all that he is coming again. I will come again, the Saviour said. That's a promise that we can take to the bank you can cash it in. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20 that all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. In other words, his promises are true and faithful and we respond to them with a hearty amen. Let it be so, Lord. There is no doubt about his coming. He shall come. That is his promise. And while we cannot predict the day or the hour, I think it's fair to say that by all indications, the return of Christ must be getting closer, certainly closer today than what it was yesterday. That's why the Lord Jesus said in Luke 21 and verse 28, that when you see these things, he spoke of events that would happen prior to his return. When you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So while there is mystery concerning his return, we also have certainty. There will be prophetic events that will indicate the nearness of his return. So there is mystery. But there is certainty. There's also scoffing concerning his return. That's why we read from 2 Peter chapter 3. There's a scoffing concerning the Lord's return. And it's not just something that happens today. It was happening even in Peter's day when he wrote his epistle. There was a question that seemed to puzzle and to bother some of the believers in Peter's day. Why hasn't the Lord returned already? What is he waiting for? It's almost 2,000 years since our Savior left this world. 
Does his delay mean that he has forgotten about us? That he isn't coming at all? Should we give up on that Christian hope of the return of our Saviour? And Peter answers and addresses that question for us in 2 Peter chapter 3. And he leaves us some wonderful truths to ponder and to think about. And the first of them being this, that despite what the scoffers might say, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ is sure and certain because it is based upon the promise of God who cannot lie. Look what they asked. Here's their question in verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? 20 centuries have come and gone. And the Lord Jesus still has not come back again. And there would be those who would tell us, give it up. Forget about it. He's not coming back. Peter answers that question. And he asks them to remember Noah's flood. He tells them that in the days of Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness and warned those around him of the impending judgment of God that was coming. He says, think about what happened in Noah's day. How that before the flood, men lived in reckless disregard of God, giving no heed to the warnings that he had given or the threat of impending judgment. They lived as if that day that Noah spoke about would never come. They sinned in every way imaginable. And then one day the skies poured forth water, and the fountains of the deep were broken up, and the water covered the entire earth. And Peter said, if God could do that once, he can do it again. Only this time, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will bring a judgment not of water, but of fire upon the earth. And he warns them that the coming of the Savior will usher in the day of judgment. Verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Notice the sequence of those words, those verses. Water, perish, fire, judgment. Peter's saying, God destroyed the world once before with water. Next time it will be with fire. And for those that are unprepared and unready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, his second coming will be bad news indeed. And those that have refused and rejected and resisted and rebelled against the Savior will one day bow before his sovereignty and confess that he is Lord. Of course, that confession will not result in their forgiveness. The day of grace will have passed for them. There's only the everlasting judgment of God waiting forth. And here Peter answers the question, this is why God is delaying the coming again of the Savior. He is providing for you a day of grace, a day of opportunity to come to the Savior while you can. Here's the good news. This delay that you're mocking and scoffing about is actually God's gift to you. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a purpose to the Lord's delay. He's providing you with a day of grace, a day of opportunity to come to the seed. And for 2,000 years or so, our Lord has been holding back on that final judgment upon all sin and it's an opportunity to give rebellious man an opportunity to turn to Christ while he can because in that day when the Savior returns as the Apostle Creed reminds us he will come to judge the living and the dead 
So when we think of the Lord's return, we think not only of how truthful the message is, but I want you to think also about how thrilling the moment of his return will be. That's why we read from 1 Thessalonians 4. It gives us a little bit of a, an insight, a glimpse into that glorious day when Christ shall return. And we will find that the, the promises of God will be realized that day. Look at what it says, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The Lord himself shall descend. The Savior himself will personally come back again. It's the Lord who is descending here. Not a substitute, not a stand-in, not a look-alike or an angel, not an Old Testament saint, not a figment of our imagination or some ghostly religious figure. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Bodily, physically, personally, shall come again to this earth. A few weeks ago when we were in the book of Acts, we looked at Acts 1 and verse 11, where the angels told the disciples upon the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what they said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And I love those words, this same Jesus, the same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, who walked the dusty streets of Galilee, who healed the sick and raised the dead and preached the good news to those in captivity. This same Jesus who was betrayed by Judas and tried by Pilate and denied by Peter and condemned and scourged and crucified. This same Jesus. Who was buried in a borrowed tomb. Who on the third day rose again. And would ascend to the Father's right hand. Where now he sits in intercession for us. At the Father's right hand in glory. This same Jesus. Who has been dismissed by many. And mocked by some. And hated by others. This same Jesus. The head of his church, the Lord of glory, the creator of the universe. This same Jesus, the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven. The one who saves us. The one to whom we sing and praise. The one in whom we come through in prayer. The one who is the very hope of every saint of God, the very one whose message we preach this day, this same Jesus is returning to the earth. Coming to the earth that rejected him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He was despised of men and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from he came once before as the Lamb of God to be sacrificed and slaughtered for the sins of men. But when he comes again, he comes as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The one who was once judged by men will come to judge men. The one who came to be crucified for us now comes to be crowned by all. The one who was mockingly referred to as the king of the Jews is returning as the king of kings and lord of lords. And they will mock him no more. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Oh, he comes with great power and authority. He'll come in pomp and ceremony. His is the voice that can wake the dead. He tells them to descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. We're told elsewhere, Jude 9, the other mention of the archangel. 
told that it's Michael. The voice of the archangel. I think of what happened in olden days whenever a king would come to town. There would be messengers who would precede him preparing the way. The town crier who would shout out, the king is coming, the king is coming. We have the shout of the Lord, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The trumpets, of course, were sounded in Old Testament times to call the people together for the feasts and celebrations and holy convocations of the people of Israel. Trumpets were sounded to raise an alarm. The shout of the Lord, the voice of the archangel, the blast of the trumpet will announce the Savior's return in fulfillment to his promise. How thrilling the promise being realized. And look what happens next. There is a people that will be raised. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's going to be a great resurrection. The dead in Christ shall rise first. There were some in Thessalonica that were worried. They were worried that when the Lord Jesus would return to gather all his people together, that he would simply take those that were alive. They were worried about what of their loved ones who had died in faith and that were buried in their graves. And Paul says, don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about them. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We won't hinder them or prevent them. But I want you to notice something. It's the dead in Christ. He's speaking about a resurrection of believers. Now the unconverted will have a resurrection also. But that will be to the great white throne of judgment. We read of the dead in Christ. We're speaking of those that have died in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says those believers will be raised at the Savior's return. Those who died in Paul's day and before that and since that. Those that are living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will receive a literal resurrection from the dead. How is it going to happen? I don't know. The Bible simply says that it will, and I believe that. The same God who raised our Savior from the dead is able to raise all the dead who followed him. That includes those that died at sea, those whose bodies were cremated, those whose bodies have buried and have returned to the dust from whence they came, those that have died in battlefields, those that have died from lingering diseases, those whose bodies have been vaporized in some fiery catastrophe. The God who created the molecules knows how to put them back together again. And they'll be raised incorruptible, indestructible, with a brand new body clothed in immortality, healed and restored, put into their right minds, raised to live forget forever and to die no more. There will be no more wheelchairs or surgeries or chemotherapy or medicines or crutches or braces or visits to the doctor. There will be no nursing homes or wasting diseases. All of it gone forever. The dead in Christ shall rise. Let the people of God rejoice. The grave will not have the final victory because the dead in Christ shall rise first. I love how the old Puritan Thomas Watson put it. He says, We are more sure to arise out of our graves than out of our beds. Oh, how precious is the dust of the believer. It's sure and certain. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. A little phrase, caught up, 
is interesting. It means to seize or to snatch away. The idea is of one who swoops down to gather something up quickly. And it implies a change of location. It literally means that the believers who are alive at the return of Christ will be lifted off the earth and brought into the Savior's presence. There will be a generation of believers who will never see death. How will it happen? In a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. Faster than you can blink. One moment you'll be in your kitchen. Next moment you'll be flying through the air to meet with the sea. One moment you'll be fixing something in your shed. And the next moment you're in the presence of the Lord. Here one moment, gone the next if you want an illustration, the only thing I can suggest to you is to take some iron filings and sprinkle them amongst some sawdust and then pass a magnet over the pile. And what happens? The force of the magnet pulls the iron filings from the pile of sawdust. And just in the same way that the magnet attracts the iron filings, even so the Lord knows those that are his. And he will gather us together off the earth to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. One of the thrilling things about the Lord's return is that there's going to be a glorious reunion. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. The dead in Christ. This is the ultimate family reunion. All of God's children from all ages, from every land and nation and people and tongue, gathered together at last in one place in the presence of the Lord. That's why as Christians we lay our loved ones to rest in the hope that they will be raised immortal when the Savior returns. Death's not the end for the Christian. It's a glorious beginning. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Their bodies brought back to life by the resurrection power of God. Raised from the grave immortal and indestructible. And we shall meet them in the air with Christ. What a great reunion. I love how the hymn writer puts it. There will be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day. What a glorious day that will be. How truthful is the promise of the Lord's return. How thrilling is the prospect of the Lord's return. I have one last thought to share with you. How tragic to miss out on the Lord's return. We've already made the point that it's the dead in Christ who shall rise from the grave at this time. It's the believer who's waiting for the coming of the Savior who's caught up to be with Christ. And that means tragically, of course, that there will be many upon the earth who will be left who will not only be separated from their loved ones, but more importantly, will be eternally separated from God. And when we think of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we have to be mindful of the necessity of being ready for his return. There is no opportunity after this event to get right with God. The day of grace is now. When the Savior returns, the day of grace ends and the day of judgment begins. And I want you to, to realize that these delays, seemingly as we see them, are really God's opportunity for you to get ready and prepared for the coming of the Savior. I know what the devil says, oh, don't worry about it. You have plenty of time. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? 
You've plenty of time. We don't know what a day will bring forth. We don't know what tomorrow holds for us, never mind what the rest of today holds for us. Oh, we've got our plans and our hopes and our expectations of what we'll do. But we never really know. Tell me, does the Bible indicate that you have plenty of time? As you read the scriptures, does it seem to indicate that you've had all the time in the world to get ready to meet the Lord? Or does it remind us that time is short? The end is approaching. And you need to be ready. You know what I find when I read the Bible when it talks about salvation? It talks about it in the present tense. Today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Not tomorrow, not next week, not sometime in the future. The only time that you have promised to you is right now, right this very moment. Your next breath is not guaranteed. Time is short. The Savior is returning. You do not have time to waste. That's why we urge you with all of our heart to turn to the Savior while you may. I can't say to you that the Savior will come in our lifetime. Or that he might come today. But I know that he is coming. And I know that you need to be ready. And since we cannot know when he will come. It stands to reason then that we should be ready now. We should be ready now. I'll finish with this. It's a little story I read. I think it, it's helpful. The story of a little girl who had been at church with her family. And in the course of the service, their minister had been talking about the, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the way home from church in the car, the little girl turned to her mum and says, Mum, do you believe? That the Lord Jesus is coming back? Yes, I believe that. Mum, could he return today? Yes, he, he could return today. The little girl thought about that for a moment. And she says, Mum, would you brush my hair? I want to be ready. Now, of course, brushing our hair will not make us ready for the coming of the Lord. But you understand the point. We want to be ready. The only way we can be ready is to come in faith and repentance, turning from our sins and trusting in the Lord for salvation. So that when that great and glorious day of his return eventually happens, and it will happen, that whether we are amongst the dead in Christ that are called first or the, those that are alive and remain. We want to be there in that great reunion. We don't want to be those that are left to await the judgment of God. How tragic. How tragic. Eternally tragic. To be unprepared for the return of Christ. Now, I can't save you. But I can point you to one who can. And if I can be of any help or assistance to you to speak about these matters, to prepare for the coming of the Lord, then I urge you to take that time, come and have a chat, and we'll point you to the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can save. And may the Lord bless you. These words to our hearts this morning. Let's pray.